OK, we are recording, so we'll go ahead and get started. Oh, it turned on transcripts automatically, too. That's interesting. Um, so welcome everyone to our featured speaker series presentation. This is the first one of the fall semester. Um, and uh, so these these presentations are an opportunity for you guys to uh, hear from previous grantees on their projects and the cool things that they've done. And it's also an opportunity for our grantees to share their work. So um, that's what we're going to do today. And uh, so our first presenters are Dr. Skanda Vivek. Please let me know if I am pronouncing that incorrectly. And Dr. Sairam Tan Tanjarala um, of the Science of Everyday Materials uh, team and, and project. Uh, we'll put links in the chat for you guys to look at anything they're presenting, uh, the, look at their project and stuff. And um, yeah, so I think I think you guys can go ahead and get started if you're if you're ready. Uh, Scott, I think you're uh, muted. Huh. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Um, all right, I was just saying thank you, Tiffany, for that introduction, and thank you all for uh, being here. So today we'd like to talk about our textbook transformation, the science of everyday materials, intended to teach science for non-science majors. And first of all, we'd like to acknowledge um, support from the Affordable Learning Georgia. And uh, without for this, um, I doubt this would be as successful of a textbook as it is. Um, right now, and uh, you know, we've, we've really enjoyed working uh, with Manifold app for the most part. Um, so our textbook is um, essentially about um, learning through various everyday phenomena, and the theme that basically cuts through this uh, learning is lens scales, or how emergent phenomena occur from the very small lens scale that you see here from nuclei and atoms, all the way to the really large lens scale, so vehicles and how that generates traffic. And so we will be talking more about um, our textbook, and this is the uh, presentation and a brief overview. So first we'll have the motivation and then a chapter overview, after which we will have talk about student feedback and share some thoughts about Manifold app. I know a lot of you are, might be very interested in it as well as our uh, recent ancillary materials grant and uh, our progress. Um, so first of all, uh, Dr. Tangirala is going to talk about the motivation. Um, and so uh, uh, please uh, start, Dr. Tangirala. Hey, uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, um, uh, so uh, just to introduce myself and uh, Dr. Vivek, we both are faculty at uh, the School of Science and Technology, and we both uh, are in the physics discipline. Um, and uh, we both have different uh, little backgrounds in the sense that uh, um, uh, Dr. Vivek had done some experiments during his PhD and did postdoc in, in, in studying um, connected systems. And I did uh, research on computational physics. Uh, so essentially, I think what I'm trying to say here is that uh, both of us uh, wanted to come up with a course which is appropriate for non-science majors. And so this is one of those courses which is required for their graduation. So typically, um, so to give you some background about the non-STEM science courses and the challenges that uh, uh, we have at Georgia Gwinnett College is that the students who take these courses usually have um, a high school level prerequisite courses. So that means some of them have taken science and math courses and some of them have not taken them at their high school levels. So essentially there's a varied distribution of background knowledge. So uh, we have to come up with a course that will uh, challenge them, uh, challenge the students and also uphold their interest uh, by keeping in mind that they are non-science majors trying to take a science course which is required. So, so that is a challenge itself here. Um, so uh, this course now has uh, been designed to cut across several science disciplines, as you will see, and uh, so it will contain materials that will go from, um, you know, um, chemistry to physics to a little bit of life sciences at the same time trying to be um, 
considerate about their background knowledge. Um, so the, so uh, I believe there is an opportunity here uh, um, for teaching a science course, uh, which may be considered as a hurdle for non-science students. Uh, I say this because I think uh, we all acknowledge and we do get this from our experience that several societal and civic responsible responsibilities in our society are managed by professionals who are typically from non-science backgrounds. And so I think it is an important aspect uh, being science faculty to to make sure that these two courses, the non-science courses that are designed for them uh, are sent home and they get an appreciation of science. And so uh, just a, a background about uh, the non-STEM science courses at our college. Um, so uh, as I was saying, uh, this is required for non-STEM majors under their science core curriculum. And usually uh, this uh, requirement of non uh, requirement of science courses is satisfied by two general science courses which are listed here. And so there are several options available at the college. Um, so ranging from survey of science to integrated science. And as you will see, uh, the, the classes itself are not uh, in-depth science. At the same time, they cover important aspects of scientific learning. And usually one of those two courses is accompanied by a lab so that students have an appreciation of how knowledge is gathered or scientific knowledge is gathered. And so a typical audience for this course is a freshman level or sophomore level. Um, again, um, the background knowledge is varied. And so we were looking up, uh, Dr. Wei came up with this uh, idea of just trying to figure out what physical sciences means according to nature portfolio. And we figured that uh, physical science is an ideal science course for non-science majors cutting across various scientific disciplines. So having that as our background, we figured that if we were to adopt a, 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 a theme for this course, which is called Science of Everyday Materials, we were not able to find textbooks which are uh, meant for this type of audience and this type of content. We looked at OpenStax, which is very popular for physics, chemistry, maths, and biology textbooks. Uh, we were not able to find a, a textbook or an open education resource for us. And also we, we tried to look at uh, the repository Merlot to see if we found, if we can get any resource. And so because we were not able to find, we found a gap there and we realized that instructors will find this resource useful for direct and easy adaptation for their requirement. Oh, this is just a, a snapshot of what we're going to talk about. Uh, the, the, the course that we have titled is called Science of Everyday Materials. And of course, this will depend from institution to institution. Um, and uh, this uh, the top picture is a snapshot uh, of the material itself, the web page, and it gives a blurb about the content. And the bottom picture gives us a, a, a snapshot of the index of various topics that are covered. And, and Dr. Vivek will go ahead and start introducing the resource to us now. Thanks, Dr. Tangirala. Um, so basically our goals were to teach science through everyday examples. And so that that way it can be fun and engaging and also accessible for diverse audiences. And the other useful thing that we wanted to impart was useful problem solving skills. So a lot of students um, typically use software like Excel and make quantitative presentations um, outside the classroom, whether it's for jobs or for uh, future graduate programs. And so we wanted to impart some of these skills. And we've also incorporated various demonstrations for in-person and hands-on labs, as well as uh, interactive demonstrations that instructors can do in classes and virtual labs. Now we realize that virtual labs are particularly important, you know, given that this transformation was happening during the pandemic. So we have also incorporated some um, uh, engaging labs. And the other thing that I want to point out is that we have a lot of education majors at GGC who typically go on to be elementary or middle school teachers. And so a lot of these hands on activities are intended to be easily adaptable and fun for a variety of audiences. Um, so the unifying theme is building blocks at various length scales, 
And so that is what runs through all of these various chapters. The first chapter is an overview of various length scales. Um, and then the, if you see the chapters going forward, they talk about the various, the smallest scales, which is the fundamental interactions and forces, all the way to materials and ultimately the science behind uh, traffic jams. And so uh, I want to go in depth into a few chapters because I think that's uh, pretty important for you to realize um, the context. Um, so like I said, the first chapter is an overview of everyday phenomena and the skills that they learn are essential math, like scientific notations, as well as how to take measurements and plotting. And we have an interactive lab on measurement where students measure their height and their arm spans of themselves and their group members. And they learn what basic correlations are, as well as errors and standard deviations. The next chapter, uh, the focus is on forces and the forces and interactions being the fundamental building blocks of our universe. Now, through this chapter, they also learn about slopes and derivatives, especially in the context of position, velocity, and acceleration. And we also have a hands-on lab that we typically do with uh, our standard physics 1111 or 1112 courses. But uh, these labs demonstrate uh, you know, the relation through hands-on experiments involving motion sensors in, in carts. And the feedback I've got from some of these students was that you know, they've learned some of these concepts in high school, but they never really were able to appreciate the actual real world connection. Uh, but when they saw the data and they plotted the graphs, they uh, really found that um, very useful. Chapters three to six are then about materials. And so uh, the, the basic theme is about how temperature plays an important role. And when temperature is increased, molecules have increased random energy. And once this energy breaks the electrical force interaction between atoms, then they convert from solids to liquids and gases. So they understand how these microscopic properties ultimately relate to the macroscopic uh, properties of large scale materials that we see. And they have online labs for uh, looking at pieces of matter. We've adapted this standard PET labs, which are you know, state of the art, simulations on, on uh, states of matter, and they're commonly used resources by physics instructors. We also have spring uh, demonstrations and vibrating speaker experiments. So these experiments were actually adapted from some research papers that did uh, experiments on moving grains of sand with a vibration speaker, and they're able to see that when you're increasing the amplitude of you know, steel balls that are vibrating, we, you see the emergence of different phases and they're able to understand how atoms are actually moving in gases, liquids, and solids. So that's, again, a pretty powerful demonstration. After they learn about materials, they learn about uh, common everyday materials that you know, surprisingly are not taught in the high school or undergraduate classroom. But in fact, this is something that we see in our everyday lives. These are uh, materials that are, have both solid, liquid, and even sometimes gas properties all at the same time. You know, a common example is ketchup. When you pour ketchup from a bottle, it's a liquid, but when it um, comes on the surface, it's a solid, right? Because ketchup does not flow like water. Uh, instead, it sits there like a solid and you can dip your fry through it. Shaving foam is another uh, very interesting example, which is basically composed of air and gas. But once you put that shaving foam on your hand, it takes its shape like a solid. And a very interesting demonstration is uh, Ublek, which has also been you know, featured in things like Mythbusters, where you can see this person is running on it. And if you just were to stand on it, it would be like a liquid and it would sink. But the key is to uh, have a high force acting on it. And basically that causes this material to thicken. So again, these are all very interesting labs. And we have seen that a all different education levels from elementary, middle school, um, high school undergraduate, even their uh, graduate students can have a lot of um, interesting fun as well as learn um, complex scientific concepts through these sorts of um, uh, contents. After this, we then talk about surface tension and soap bubbles. And the uh, highlight of this chapter is a lab on making extremely huge soap bubbles and also understanding some recent scientific developments 
in this topic of surface tension and soap bubble stability. Next, um, we talk about life essentials in the book, where now that they've learned about these various um, molecules um, and compounds, they learn about how just a few subset of molecules are very important for the emergence of life. In particular, they learn the importance of carbon and in the four basic molecules of life, as well as wa why water is so essential. And towards this, they do some labs uh, where they're actually able to visualize how water at four degrees Celsius is actually much more dense than water at zero degrees, which causes this particularly unique anomalous expansion property, and without which life would not be possible because all the oceans would freeze up. But instead, we have you know, these layers of ice at the top, and below is liquid water, and you can still have life survive through the ice ages. Um, uh, in addition, they have a hands-on lab for extracting DNA from fruit that we've recently put together. And through this, they can understand, you know, this complex concept of DNA and they can visualize it. And again, this sorts of, uh, this textbook always goes through this um, concept that visualization is very powerful. The last chapter is the science of traffic and why traffic jams form sometimes for no apparent reasons except that vehiculars, uh, vehicles and humans driving these vehicles are imperfect. And they understand how, while individual drivers cannot be predicted, traffic is very predictable and above a certain density or number of vehicles per unit kilometer, you see very predictable traffic jams emerging. Um, there's a nice virtual lab on density, velocity and emergent traffic that students have access to, as well as group demonstration of traffic and how traffic is formed from students in a circle. We haven't been really able to do this lab because of the COVID pandemic, but this amounts to uh, having a few different students form a circle, trying to all move at a uniform pace. And what you will see is because some students might go a little bit faster than others, you will see traffic jams emerging. All right, so now we want to discuss uh, a little bit about the student feedback. So this feedback is from the semester we are implementing the textbook transformation. So this is the third semester. And we've uh, gotten a lot of different positive feedback about various aspects. The first is that uh, the textbook is very helpful as well as it's um, directly coincides with the class objectives. And so what we're seeing from the student feedback is they can use the textbook and it's useful for uh, the course goals. And that is also reflected by the second feedback. The third feedback is also uh, very useful to us, and that was one of the primary goals of creating this, is that it is cost effective, and we didn't find too many cost effective resources on physical science. Uh, there were some Pearson um, uh, books like Conceptual Science by Paul Hewitt, but that costed uh, upwards of $100. Um, and you can see here that this was pretty useful. And then the fourth feedback was that you know, textbook is great, but they wished it had a lot of more examples and uh, problems for solving. And that was also some of the motivations behind uh, our ancillary materials grant that we will be discussing very soon. Um, we also found from the student responses uh, that largely positive opinions about the materials, but we did notice that there was not a significant difference in drop fail withdrawal rates before and after the textbook transformation. And we think this is also in part due to many confounding factors. Um, this also coincided with the COVID pandemic. So uh, a lot of the you know, transformation itself had to be done during the time where we had online and hybrid courses. Uh, we also have different um, instructors, right? Dr. Tangirala and I have slightly different styles in teaching. So we think these are some confounding factors for the DFW rates um, that you know, we saw. Next, we want to talk a little bit about uh, the thoughts about the Manifold app. Uh, as well as some challenges that we faced, and Dr. Tangirala is going to talk about this. Okay, thank you. Uh, well, I just realized uh, we ran through almost more than half of our slides, and uh, we still have a lot of time. And I think uh, what I want to do is before uh, we go ahead there, I just am realizing that all the attendees at this time are apparently uh, outside your organization. That's what uh, I see here. So I just want to get a, a poll. How many of the attendees are uh, educators? 
uh, educators, you know, school level or college level, doesn't matter. If you could let let us know in chat, that that will just give me an idea of uh, what brought you here and how uh, we can um, we can show our resource. You know, we're not yet shown you the material, so we'd like to show you the actual material which is online, and then concentrate on uh, some aspects that might be of interest to you. Good point. I, I've also showed the book. I realize that we haven't shown it yet. So I've uh, gotten to the actual textbook. Okay. Um, um, is the chat facility open? Can it so sh it should be oh. available. Um, uh, I see a response from uh, Lucy. Um, I was uh, I run Galileo, interested in the content, but also what you thought of. Oh, good, good. So Lucy is here to get some feedback about Manifold. And uh, yes, we have that included. Uh, in fact, that was the next section. And I think we have some more guests typing. So, so essentially this, typing, yeah. You know, while you're typing, um, I'm just going to show you how it looks. You know, this is the, if you were to land on the page, I wonder if you, I think the resource is shared. Uh, you will see that there's the table of contents and basically Manifold app does this for us and Dr. Tangrala will talk about it, but it gives you a nice directory structure where you can see there's, uh, you know, various resources. Um, you can see all the different chapters. Okay, uh, so perhaps Dr. Vivek, you can actually perhaps show in depth a chapter about what all content has been uploaded and uh, let us know about how this can be easily adapted by other institutions, other faculty, uh, what resources are, are available already at this time. Sure, sure. So, you know, there's the textbook which has um, all the content in it. And apart from that, towards the end of the chapter, there are um, example problems, right? So you can see here, this, these are you know, these are embedded, and this is something that I will that I wanted to talk about later. But this is, I think, a good time to get to it. But we have these ancillary materials, and uh, they're basically embedded as Word documents, and the students can also you know go to the resource and download these Word documents. There's also the scope to have additional resources as long as websites allow embedding. So this is from I believe Varsity tutor.com, and so you can see some additional resources. Uh, there's also the slides that, uh, you know, we have actually two versions of, of these slides. Uh, we're currently uh, looking at how to get both versions running, so Dr. Tangrala's and mine, and, you know, that's something we want to talk about um, as well, some of the challenges. And then there's finally these lab activities that you see here. This is in particular lab about height and arm width measuring um, that the students, you know, fill a report and, and do it. Uh, you're muted. Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, if you can go back to the slides, I will uh, continue the content. I did see some uh, some uh, some people saying they're curious about the content. I'll be we would be happy to have a, like an in-depth discussion on the content, <laughs> or maybe if we had time remaining, uh, we might get to the content again. And uh, yeah, uh, feel free to send us an email. We have our email addresses listed there. All right. OK, here. Yeah. Um, so um, I think uh, essentially uh, from the, the brief demo that we saw about the material, uh, the aim that I and Dr. Vivek have is that as an instructor goes to this resource, they will have a repository of slides, question banks, quizzes, example problems, homeworks. They can just directly download it and use it for their course. So we want to make adaptation by other faculty as easy as possible. I always envision when I joined as a faculty, they used to come up with, uh, the publisher used to come up with a, a CD containing all the materials. So essentially that is what we are hoping that uh, we will provide here. Uh, now, I think I want to talk a little bit about uh, the app itself. Uh, can I go to the previous slide? Um, 
even here. OK, yes. So manifold is uh, is the essentially the the workhorse for hosting this materials online. And so uh, Unisys System of Georgia um, hosts this and allows uh, content creators to upload materials. And so I would like to present some experiences that we have had with this uh, app, uh, with this thing called Manifold app. Um, so firstly, uh, as it is said, Manifold app is visually very appealing. If you if somebody were to look at the content, it is very appealing, easy to navigate. And, and, and it provides so for a user who's able to log in and access the resource, they're able to provide or use annotation tools for themselves. So an instructor can cr create annotations, notes for certain portions of the text and have the users use it. So that is a good feature of Manifold app, and it is easy for um, creating HTML based content very easily. So it has a very small learning curve, so it can easily be used by content creators to create uh, materials online. Um, and also another feature is that it provides options for embedding existing videos from uh, other websites like YouTube and, and any other websites which have embedding uh, capabilities. Uh, if you can get the embed code, Manifold will allow to use this in our materials. So that is a good um, uh, thing. And I, I think as Tiffany is pointing out in the chat, Manifold app equals to open ALG. Uh, um, and also, um, I think one more feature it has, which was recently added in last one year, is that uh, it has uh, the user or the content creator is able to look at the global analytics based on the data uh, of the web traffic. So I'm just showing you a snapshot of the web traffic. So th the web traffic is shown on a global level. So you, you, you know how many people are visiting, what days and things like that. Um, and there will be some host of challenges here uh, that uh, we want to say. Yes, uh, as Jeff is saying, Open ALG is Affordable Learning Georgia's instance of the manifold, which is the platform. OK, thank you. Um, so some challenges that we uh, encountered was um, firstly, creating a open resource, open education resource itself is more than just creating a textbook because it requires putting together different sorts of materials to help student learning. So that itself is an uh, important thing. And second, at this time, in our experience, we have not seen open ALG to handle version controls of different files. So we, we don't know how to roll back if something were to go wrong. We are not aware of that feature. Um, and at the same time, what I and Dr. Vivek have found is if multiple users were to log in to a project at the same time, the system does not alert that multiple users are logged in. So multiple people are able to make changes without knowing what is happening. And so for this reasons, we kind of decided as a team who is the person who's going to make additions to the manifold uh, to the open ALG content. Um, and then um, as uh, as we can see, if you were to browse uh, the manifold app, the visitors are not able to add any content or comments to existing web pages. Unlike you know, YouTube videos, that comment feature is not enabled. Um, uh, one more thing I would have liked is a Manifold app, if it can provide drill down analytics about which pages are visited more, which pages are not, which videos are played more. So those type of drill down analytics may add some more value to the creators. Um, and then for updating the websites, I think this uh, Dr. Wig can step in. Uh, what was the procedure that you followed Dr. Wig for updating the content? Yeah, I mean, what was convenient for me was to you know, put a single zip file uh, for all the content. Uh, I, I do remember uh, Tiffany and Jeff saying there are you know, ways to do each chapter separately. So they are, they are the experts, so they can you know, correct, correct us if, I, if I'm wrong. Uh, but yeah, so that, that's the way I did it, was all content files um, zipped. 
So, so in our uh, way of implementing, uh, if you were adding a chapter, uh, that HTML file was bundled into one zip file with all other files, and then the whole single zip file was uploaded. And, and yeah. so that that was the way in which we were doing. So this is sort of a little bit of a hassle every time uploading entire files. Um, and at this time, actually, which is a good feature, would have liked is. Um, at this time, there is no way to download the entire text as a printer friendly file. So if there are 10 chapters, there is no way to download all 10 of them and to keep it offline. So that one feature would help uh, students or the users to have it downloaded and not be online always for accessing the content. Uh, we were not sure of, uh, of the apply the compliance ch uh, checkers or tools with ADA compliance requirements or any spell checks uh, tools which are there or not there. So we were doing it by ourselves. Um, another uh, experience that we had with uh, Manifold app was if two instructors were having uh, their own class materials, just like I shown in the picture here, course materials one, course materials two. Imagine they're coming from two instructors, I and Dr. Vivek. And if we were to kind of create a nice zip file on and, and have a nice directory structures like lectures and uh, homeworks and quizzes and everything is nicely in a structured format, if we were to upload it on the Manifold app, all the files show up cluttered as you can see at the bottom. There is no one way to organize this content. So the users will have to kind of sort through and download what they need. So that was something it's still learning for us to figure out a best way to upload materials. And uh, Team Dy uh, Dynamics, Dr. Wig, would you like to talk on Team, Dy team Dynamics? Um, yeah, so basically, uh, we, we designated, uh, so I was, you know, the one who was uploading stuff on Manifold app. And we also had weekly uh, meetings to review and talk about the content that was uh, uploaded. Um, and right now, what we are, we have an ancillary grant. And so we are planning to hire a student worker. We're going through all the steps and processes at uh, GGC. Uh, and they were look, really looking forward to that to help with ADA compliance checks, and especially since we have two different instructor resources to make it, um, you know, in an organized way to have, you know, both together. As of now, basically there is there's just one one of our resources are uploaded. Um, yeah, the, Dr. Tangrala, you want to talk about this last point? Okay. Yeah. So uh, obviously, Manifold app has the feature of uploading, embedding uh, existing videos. Um, so if it is YouTube, I think the closed captioning can be can be enabled if the original author has enabled it uh, of the video. And in case of our lab activities that the instructor wants to create, um, I think that closed captioning feature needs to be added by the author or the content creator. So that one feature, if it were to be there, that will make uh, you know um, working with uh, videos uh, really easy. Yeah, so and I'd also like to add that Manifold app has been really good for some of the basic functionalities that we have until now, uh, like just uh, the, uh, uploading content, uploading images, you know, embedding videos, and that's mostly you've worked with the constraints, and that's that's been good because uh, there's a lot of different things to take into account while writing a textbook. Um, but uh, that being said, we have seen some limitations, especially with the resources and resource collections, and they, it's a little bit cumbersome. Um, working with that, and we're, we're still trying to figure out with the ancillary materials the best way to present it. OK, so now we'll talk about the ancillary materials. That is what we've been working on in this semester. So the goal now is to add presentations, example problems, and lab activities. And so what we have done so far is uh, added a unit on math essentials that we found uh, a lot of these non uh, the non science majors coming in they have so different backgrounds that we have gathered together all all of the various different resources on scientific notations and um, units and graphs and made an appendix on it 
And you've also added presentations, example problems, and lab activities as you've started you know, teaching the few chapters. And uh, we are currently waiting to onboard a student for consolidating the various different materials, um, as well as updating content based on this academic year's feedback and video uh, demonstrations. So that's the another really good thing about the, the way we've been doing it and Manifold App is that we can have continuous improvement based on student feedbacks. And for all of you who are teaching, you know that it's not something static that uh, you teach once and then you, you use the same resources forever. I mean, you could do that, but a, a much better way is to have a, a living, breathing resource that you keep changing and based on current events and based on your thoughts uh, and what you learn, uh, you keep changing the contents and keep making it better and better. And we have the ability to do that. So this is some feedback that uh, I like to take some midterm feedback just to see how things are going. And I added in some feedback about the textbook. And I was really glad to see that students are very appreciative of the new resources that we have been putting in, especially the PowerPoints and example problems embedded into it. And it makes it easy to find all the information. Um, so the current, the way we were working on this before was to have it in D2L, uh, which is uh, the system that we use. You know, different universities would have different systems, and all the resources would be added into you know D2L and the contents and um, various different places, right? But now with the textbook, we can add a lot of that inside the textbook itself, um, and this makes it uh, as you're as we're seeing, it's quite convenient for the student as well as, as it's easy for the instructor to make a central location. Um, so there's a lot of room for improvement, um, especially you know, with the ancillary materials, and then more accessible presentation of the materials. So one of the struggles with you know, writing a textbook in various, in, in any platform, whether it's Manifold or anything else, is how to make the, pre the presentation very accessible. You know, working with a big uh, publisher like Pearson would have they would have access to a huge staff working on every different aspect of the textbook. Um, the, the primary author would be responsible for the primary content, but then there's all a lot of different contents and videos and other uh, resources, and even making it presentable, right? So, but this is uh, the work of um, two of us right now. And so we've been taking some time and you know we, we've seen, seen it improving. Uh, but there's some room for improvement to make, to make it more accessible. Um, and in particular, going in depth on these uh, hard concepts, as well as giving students enough information so that just with the textbook, they can understand quite a lot. Um, uh, redundant information so that they are listening in class and they're reading the textbook. Um, and you know, it's all in all, they have all the resources that they need. And finally, there's a lot of scope for content creation, so making videos and other uh, interactive resources and putting that and embedding it into the content. And that's where this is really unique as an open access resource and a living, breathing um, repository where we can add various sorts of contents. So in summary, we have a free and accessible e-textbook for teaching non-science majors in the everyday context. There's also engaging labs to supplement the book and support the course and also be used outside the course. There's a suite of instructor materials for easy adoption by other faculty. And that's where we also want to go with this is to see if there's other faculty that are interested and actively engage with other faculty from the University System of Georgia as well as outside. Um, and we're continuously improving through student feedback. Um, and if you're interested, please contact either me or Dr. Tangrala, and um, also please have a look at our repository, and we will be happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Um, so I have uh, turned on the microphone and camera features for our guests, so if you guys have any questions, you can put them in the chat or you can turn on your microphone and speak to our presenters. We do have in the in the chat uh, from Jeff. Uh, he wanted to point out 
um, that if you go into the back end of your project and click on text and then the text that you want to view, um, there's actually a little bit more um, analytics there. You can look at a chapter by chapter breakdown of views. Um, Unfortunately, the analytics are very new still, so um, they're only counting from like August 19th, I think, <laughs> but uh, but it is um, a little helpful to be able to see that as well. Yeah, that's great to know. Yeah. Thanks. I see somebody raising their hand. Hey, yes, this is Lucy. I've got a question. I noticed on your embedded practice questions, you had the answers you know, right there with the questions. Was that a deliberate choice on your part or was that sort of a limitation of Manifold that caused you to, to put that in there? No, that was uh, deliberate. So these are basically Word documents with the problems and then uh, the solution, the, the answer. So um, we've heard from students that they would love uh, to have the solutions uh, and especially so these are example problems so these are not uh, the homework assignments these are just for practice right and so definitely that was um, deliberate um, also maybe i want to add here lucy um, uh, the, what is shown is just the final answer um, so essentially uh, you know um, students are required to show the steps to arrive at the answer um, I was suggesting that uh, because in my experience, if I give um, a problem without an answer, students get confused as to what the answer is. They don't know whether they got it right or wrong. So for that purpose, I just put the final answer. And, and also uh, what I do with this is I have like one of the class days to have the students like in a, a flipped classroom where they work through these questions. And so I, I keep going and you know answering their questions. And if they have the final answer, they know that they've done it right. Even though, like Dr. Tangarla was saying, a lot of times there's a lot of steps to it. So just having the final answer is not enough. That makes sense. Thank you. Thanks for your question. If anyone else has has any questions, um, like I said, feel free to turn on your microphone or raise your hand or put it in the chat. Um, any of those is fine. Frank was saying he was um, uh, curious about the content. Uh, was there anything in particular? Because we have a little bit of time. Um, Or uh, was that, I forget, was that before we did the uh, in-depth discussion of the content? In which case, it will be redundant. It may have been before, um, but it, uh, but if, you know, if there, if, if, if anyone would like you to embellish on anything, um, you know, I think, I think those questions are definitely welcome too. Looks like we've got a couple of people typing in the chat. So while they're typing, I'll just uh, ask another question real quick. You mentioned that you were, and, and maybe you answered this and I just missed it, but you mentioned about the different slides and that you were wanting mm -hmm. to sort of have, you know, you know, one of your slides in one version and another person's slides in another. Were you able to figure out how to do that or? Um, what was the solution there? So the easy way for that would be embedding, but um, so there, there's various ways. Uh, we could embed both of the resources, but we think that that would just be you know overkill. Students see two different slide versions. So instead, what uh, what we wanted to do is to have um, the resources on Manifold, and we've encountered some issues with that. Uh, so there, there is a way to have resource collections. So for example, course materials one and course materials two, right? Uh, but the thing with that is, apart from this, there's also this clutter that's shown here, and we have not figured out a way to hide all of this. Um, you can see that uh, it's basically quite confusing to see these, these two different collections. Um, uh, yeah, so we haven't, figure out the best way to do this, but you figure out a various um, uh, suboptimal ways, if that makes sense. And we're, we're trying to uh, figure this out before the end of the semester. 
I'll add um, that I, I think you, you guys emailed me about that um, a little while ago. And we did um, we did kind of figure, you know, I guess, see that, that that's uh, a limitation that um, is on everyone's uh, projects that have resources. And so we actually, um, Jeff and I have the ability to make suggestions to Manifold and uh, like for future updates. And that is one of the things that we have actually already submitted um, to hopefully have, uh, you know, ha have like a function to turn off the ability to see individual projects and only show categories, maybe just a little bit more um, functionality there and a little bit more control over the way things show up on your page. Um, as well as just being able to organize them would be nice. So, yeah, are are you looking for hiding both uh, the course materials one and course materials two thing and the presentation document file all those things the the resources at the bottom? So, uh, th this would be useful to have these two separate, right? So then the students uh, know there's two versions, but then yeah, these collections here, this basically hide all this right yeah it because it's one big category instead of being able yeah. to kind of go in more granular mm. yeah that makes sense yeah that's something that that they have to fix on their end i will um uh i guess a not not really a question about your um presentation but a question for you um I, would you be able to share your list of challenges that you had in your presentation uh, with us? Because um, I would love to actually look into that at, at Manifold and see if some of those things maybe can be resolved already or um, are on, you know, on the horizon or are planned to uh, be resolved in the future. Yeah, like they should be able to export an EPUB uh, of the text and I did see that option, but I didn't. Uh, I didn't. I clicked on enable EPUB, mm -hmm. but I don't know where to get it. Get the link from. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, according to them, it, it every five minutes the server should be scanning to see where enable EPUB is checked off, and then it should be adding a button to enable uh, download EPUB. But I do not see it after five minutes, so it's it's a little weird right now. So do we have any other questions? Um, the other thing would be the version control, uh, which would be nice to have or to somehow have multiple, you know, users make uh, new materials because if we, we wanted this to be something like a lot of users can add, you know, different materials with a similar theme. Like um, in GitHub, where it would fork. Yeah. Exactly, mm. like forking. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then with the, the comments, um, that's also a limitation. I think users need to log in. in order to yeah, they need to log in in order to be able to uh, put in any comments. Uh, it, it doesn't mean that they need to uh, be a member of a USG institution or anything like that, but there are no anonymous comments for sure. And I, I think that may be by design. Um, you know, just to make sure that there is some sort of identifier for people who are commenting on stuff. Plus, once you create an account, you can then personalize your, your view and stuff like that. So Jeff, since uh, this, the materials are available to anybody worldwide, does that mean that they can also comment? Um, they they can in public comments, uh, or they can create uh, you know private at um, annotations, which is what most of the annotations in our texts are. Uh, kind of a personal notes that they're keeping for later. Um, but yeah, uh, there are ways to enable uh, a view to see where annotations are being written and where highlights are, are being written, but those are the uh, 
public ones only. Right? Unless you have a private group like a class where everybody just shares their own uh, within that class. Well, if uh, if anyone has additional questions for our presenters, um, they did put their emails up on their final slide. But if you guys uh, would like to add your uh, emails to the chat as well, um, I'm sure that uh, I'm sure that they'd be willing to answer questions uh, through email if you have any. Um, but uh, thank you guys so much for doing this presentation with us. It was really informative, um, really exciting to see the uh, the content of the textbook and the cool things that you've done with it, um, and also to hear about those challenges using Manifold um, because uh, that's something that we haven't really had the opportunity to talk with a lot of teams about because not a lot of teams are really digging into Manifold the way that you guys did for your project. So. Um, it was really great to hear about all of it, honestly. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, this was this was great. I mean, we've got some some ch chats uh, going on uh, that your you know your text is really nice. Your presentation was well organized. Um, so this was this was great, and I think that uh, you'll definitely get a lot of views uh, of the recording as well. So um, so again, thank you so much. Um, if you have anything else to say before I turn off the recording? Yeah, thanks so much, Tiffany, and thanks, Jeff. And this has been yeah, great to have your support. And um, yeah, if any faculty is interested, like if you're teaching any course and you're interested in some of the materials, let us know. Or if you're interested in maybe you you have to teach nonsense majors and uh, you would like to adopt uh, the entire course, that would also be good. And we'll be happy to work with you on that. Uh, Dr. Tangrala, is there anything you want to add? Uh, just a, a final thing that I wanted, uh, perhaps Jeff's or Tiffany's or uh, perhaps somebody here from Galileo, their uh, thoughts about. So, uh, so obviously we want to include some uh, some some materials which are openly accessible for students to download, and some which are restricted for faculty, just like exams and things like this. And so at this time, we were really not sure what is the best way to keep some exams and, and, and things like this, answer keys behind a, a, a password protected. We didn't know what kind of feature would be appropriate for that. Um, yeah, at, at the moment, um, that is not a function that's available in Manifold. Um, so what some of the other teams have done, including my own uh, project in Manifold, uh, is they set up a space in their own uh, storage, maybe the uh, OneDrive connected to your email. Uh, to hold on to those things and then we include an email address or a form of some kind to request those materials. Um, and so that yeah, that's that's kind of how it's gone right now. Unfortunately, it's a little bit manual. Uh, so when I get requests for quiz banks, I'll usually just go and um, like search for their name at their institution to confirm that they are instructors. Um, but uh, it, it, I guess it depends on how how many requests you get uh, that sort of determines how how uh, how cumbersome that is. Right, and it's tough to to determine who is a faculty member, who is a student. Um, OpenStax still is contending with this. They have real human beings checking to make sure that anyone requesting instructor materials is actually an instructor. Um, we have an authentication system now uh, in the library realm that does include uh, attributes for each person, but it's not fully there yet. We couldn't just go, all right, we're only allowing access on this web page to access the exams for faculty only. I, I think that's still in the works, right, Lucy? Yes, so first off, not all of the institutions have agreed to pass, you know, those those attributes of, of what um, somebody's yeah. status is. So it, that, so that's not 100 percent. And also somebody, you know, could have, um, you know, a faculty status, 
but be enrolled in a class. So it's right. not you know a hundred percent that just because you have that status or or even that email you know address that that you know that you're not perhaps taking a, a class as a student. So we're actively talking through you know ways ways to to accomplish what you're talking about, um, but we don't have a great solution yet other than what Tiffany just outlined. Yeah, so far it would be by request would be the best way. So with that, um, I'll go ahead and say one final thank you um, and and then I'll go ahead and turn off the recording. Uh, right now. <laughs>